We're gonna go ahead and get started right on time. We're gonna be respectful of everybody's time. Thank you everybody for coming tonight for our uh, virtual program, the Ask the Author series. So this one tonight is titled Seeing Arizona, Imagining Mars. And before I hand it off to our esteemed speaker, Michael, I'm gonna go ahead and just give a little introduction on the Arizona Historical Society. So, uh, just a little quick introductions. Um, the staff that you'll see on this call, myself, um, Shannon Fleischman, I'm the head curator at the Arizona Historical Society, and Dr. David Turpey. He is vice president of exhibition, education, and publications, as well as the editor of the Journal of Arizona History, which we will talk a little bit more about in just a minute. So just a little bit about AHS. Um, we were established um, by a Territorial Legislation Act on November 7th, 1864. And we are actually the oldest historical agency in Arizona. Um, and we are striving to live up to this miss mission statement, which is connecting people through the power of Arizona's history. And so that's really become um, more broad in the recent um, past for us at AHS. And we are trying to find new and exciting ways to make Arizona history relevant to a lot of people. And that's kind of one of these exciting things that we're doing with this talk about Mars and Arizona and how those two connect tonight. Um, so if you are a huge history nerd like myself, we would encourage you to, when you go and re-register your car, to look for our new super cool license plates that are at the DMV. So these license plates uh, feature the monsoon um, season, which uh, unfortunately we did not get a whole lot this year, but hopefully we will have more, or this past year, but hopefully we'll have a little bit more and this uh, license plate will hopefully conjure a little bit more. So you can find those at all the Arizona MVDs. Um, and then just so that you are aware, we have two of our locations that are currently open, the Arizona History Museum in Tucson and the Arizona Heritage Center in Tempe. And um, both are open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And we are doing social distancing and encouraging everybody to wear masks. If you would like to purchase your tickets ahead of time, you can absolutely do that just to ensure a smooth and easy process when you come to our museums. And then we are super excited about two new exhibitions that we have. Unframed, a photo journey through Navajo and Hopi nations from 1977 to 1978 literally open today and it is so beautiful. We had um, photographer and artist Catherine McKenna in our exhibition today and she was blown away with how her photographs look almost 40 years later. So she's ha really happy with it and we're excited to show all of you this. Um, the, next, the next exhibit that we have opening is near and dear to my heart. I'm curating this one and is hand in hand with the talk that we have going on right now. It's called Ready to Launch, Arizona's Place in Space, and it opens on May 20th of this year at our Arizona History Museum down in Tucson. And we will have more upcoming um, space-related public programming events, so make sure that you're following us on social media and you keep up with our um, calendar at ezhs.org slash calendar for all of those. And then here are a couple of the uh, virtual programming events that we have coming up in the next couple of weeks. So next week, Thursday, May 6th, um, we are doing a somewhat of a workshop because we get a lot of questions about this. Um, so when you're buying a older home in Arizona and you have a little bit of uh, questions about is your house home or is it historic and what you're allowed to do and update with it? Um, our archivists are going to help walk you through that process. So that one is, is my house historic or just old? Um, and then on Saturday, May 8th, we have um, voices of graduates of a dual language school. And that is um, geared towards educators or anybody interested in um, education in multiple languages. So that one is super exciting. And we made it on a weekend so that educators can attend. And then the last one is um, tied hand in hand with our exhibit that's at the Arizona History Museum, the Barry Goldwater exhibition. And so this one talks more in depth about his ham radio that is on display. If you'd like to attend any of those, again, you can find the information azhs.org slash calendar. And it's just signing up like you did for this one tonight. Okay, and back to the journal, which I, I have to 
applaud David for this. So he is the editor and the journal is an outstanding piece of academic research and really highlights the exciting, um, almost overlooked history that Arizona has had for a long time. But now we're highlighting all of these really golden nuggets that are coming out of the archives. And so um, the most recent issue was a double issue and it has been praised across academic circles and uh, like history conferences, the Western uh, History Conference. So um, if you become a member, you get all of our back issues of the Arizona Historic or Journal of Arizona History, and you get the um, future issues in print as well. And it's on Muse if you already have a Project Muse membership. So if you have any other questions, feel free to visit us at azhs.org. But I am going to hand it over to David for an introduction for our lovely speaker tonight. OK. Uh, thanks, Shannon. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. I am pleased to introduce our featured presenter tonight for our latest installment of Ask the Author. Dr. Michael Amundsen is a professor of history at Northern Arizona University, where he teaches undergraduate courses on the American West, the Southwest, uh, general US history, and the history of sports in the United States. At NAU, he also started the Public History Emphasis in 2014 and has served as its director ever since. He is the author of five books. His most recent book is called Talking Machine West, a history and catalog of Tin Pan Alley's first Western recordings, 1902 to 1918, which was published by the University of Oklahoma Press in 2017. He has also authored numerous book chapters and journal articles including two journal articles in the Journal of Arizona History. And he is joining us tonight to tell us about his 2017 article from the Journal of Arizona History, titled Seeing Arizona, Imagining Mars, Deserts, Canals, Global Climate Change in the American West. Welcome, Dr. Amundsen. Thank you, David, for that nice introduction. It's uh, thanks everybody for coming on a, on a Thursday night. Uh, this is a really, interesting time while the universities are running ahead of schedule. So uh, this is actually, uh, we just had our last finals today. I'm in between, uh, I graded uh, about 32 10 page papers earlier in the week. And by about a half an hour ago, I got 17 10 page papers. So uh, those, are, those are in store for me when I'm done. I'm gonna put up a PowerPoint and then kind of go through that for you uh, before we get to the questions. So. Uh, David, can you make sure that uh, my PowerPoint, can you let me know orally that the PowerPoint is up and going? Yes, I'll let you know. Okay, can you see it? Uh, oh, I, you know what? I, I can't. All right, you know what? I Of course, I just taught the whole semester on, on uh, Zoom. And of course, I still find myself sometimes going and just opening something and thinking, oh yeah, you can see it instead of sharing it so you can actually see it. So let me get to that. Hang on just a minute. Uh... Well, let's see, we had this all, oh, here it is, here it is. How about now? Yep, that's perfect. There we go. Um, all right, so this is a paper, as, as David said, I'm a historian of the American West. Uh, I write about things like music and photography, and I've written a book about uranium mining. And this project actually got started from a very odd place. Um, so Percival Lowell, uh, founded the observatory here in Flagstaff in 1894. He was a businessman, an author, a mathematician, and an astronomer. And he fueled the speculation that there were canals on Mars that had been built by intelligent beings who were very democratic because that's what it would take to put all these things together. And this was a very common held belief uh, in the 1880s and 1890s. Um, it's been since disproven, of course, um, you know, the people, astronomers were already dis disputing it 
at in Lowell's time, but then uh, certainly the uh, aircraft, the spacecraft that went there in the 1970s, this proved it. And of course, if you've been watching the, the fun helicopter journeys, we're not seeing any canals on Mars today. But I was always curious about why people believed him. Um, and the basic summary that I've come to that is that people in the American West were doing the same things he was talking about Martians were doing. And that's what I sort of went out to, to look at. Now, I can also tell you that there's an interesting sidebar to this. If you look at the, the screen now, this is from Goodwill Hunting. This is where Robin Williams' character is talking about uh, Pudge uh, hitting the home run in the bottom of the 12th inning in the 1975 World Series and how he missed it because he was seeing his future wife uh, at a bar. Well, my story sort of has a similar connection. Um, this is my wife, Lauren Demuth Amundsen, who is the archivist at Lowell Observatory. And I met Lauren back in 2005 uh, when I was invited to play on the Lowell Infrared Sox softball team. And Lowell was play and Lauren was playing first base for the Infrared Sox as well. And we started dating and found a lot in common. And she started going to conferences with me. And she went to a Western history conference with meeting with me. And I said, you know, you have to have some reason as to why you're here. You can't just say you're tagging along with me. And I said, you know, Lowell was believed in, it, in irrigation. Why don't you tell people that you're studying irrigation on Mars and that'll go over. And we sort of told people that and laughed about it for about three years. And I finally said, you know, that's actually kind of an interesting idea. I'm gonna look into if there's any, if anyone's ever written anything about that and maybe do a little more research on it. Well, if you wanna read about Mars, there's no place better than the library at Lowell Observatory. So I gotta spend a lot of time with my future wife reading books about Mars. And as I say in the paper that was published, the literature on Mars is like the universe. It's huge and it's expanding. Uh, as a Western historian, I'm used to reading, you know, a few things about a subject, but people have been writing about Mars in a, for a long, long time. Well, what I found as I was doing this research is that there were sort of some things that I understood and then there's some things I didn't understand. And there's sort of emergence of three different timelines going on. And that's sort of what I'm gonna to talk to you about tonight. First of all, there is this one right here, and this is basically the history of land uh, settlement in the American West and the ways in which the federal government was trying to give away the land, especially the arid lands in the West, and especially turning towards irrigation. So, of course, the Homestead Act had been passed in 1862, um, and so, but that didn't really address water. It really didn't address the arid West. Uh, the Desert Land Act I'll talk about is really the beginning of this and goes all the way to the completion of Roosevelt Dam here in Arizona in 1911. This blue section I pretty much knew. This was right in my uh, wheelhouse for understanding for Western history. This is the Mars stuff. And I didn't know too much about Mars. I thought this was a good idea, but I had to go read a lot about Mars and think about ways that people have written about Mars. And some people had talked about how you know, Lowell was from Massachusetts and there were canals in Massachusetts. And so maybe that's how he saw it, but I thought it was different because he was really talking about irrigation. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this timeline. And then there's also another timeline and that is the Arizona timeline. And this is mostly how Arizonans reacted to what Lowell was writing about Mars as well as what the country was talking about at the same time. And so there's sort of these three different timelines that I'm gonna to try to take you through tonight to talk to you sort of about how I looked at this and sort of the, some of the primary sources that I was working with as I was writing uh, this article. So we begin with the Desert Land Act of 1877 when Congress decided that it wanted to encourage and promote the economic development of the arid public lands of the Western United States places like Wyoming and Utah and New Mexico and Arizona and Nevada. Through the act, individuals could apply for a desert land entry to reclaim, irrigate, and cultivate arid lands. Now, this was Congress's first attempt to really recognize that this was a desert and needed water in order to put homesteaders on it. 
The Desert Land Act, though, was pretty much a failure because it didn't provide any means, any money for doing this. It was very difficult for a family of four to go out and dam the Colorado River and bring water to their land. Uh, you know, it just didn't work. So the first timeline will be sort of, we'll be really going through this chronologically just to be thinking about how P, the synergy between government land reform, government land giveaways, uh, water, and Mars. So we'll start with the Desert Land Act. The next year we have John Wesley Powell's report on the arid lands. And I like to show this map in class because this is how Powell envisioned the American West. In his report on the arid lands, he talked about settling the West according to watersheds, what he called watershed democracies. This is a map of all of the watersheds of the interior West. Of course, that doesn't look anything like our West that we have today because his ideas, although they were, uh, revolutionary were basically ignored. Um, but Powell is very important for understanding that water and the control of water was so important in looking at the arid lands. It's funny that in 1878, the Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli also was interested in irrigation and he did that through his look at Mars. He is the first astronomer and this is his map showing all of these what he called canali or canals that were connecting the polar ice caps uh, of Mars to other areas. And he could see these through his telescope and he believed that Mars was a desert planet and that intelligent Martians were, uh, had set up these canals to take the melting solar ice caps and make the deserts around the world bloom. It's interesting that that's right at the same time as the United States is dealing with this as well. In 1891, two important things happened on this timeline. First, the Irrigation Age, a magazine devoted to irrigation was first published by this guy, William Smythe. Um, also, the National Irrigation Congress met for the first time and it was organized by Smythe and Elwood Mead, the Wyoming water engineer. This is the guy for whom Lake Mead uh, is named. Also, Francis E. Warren, a senator from Wyoming, was involved in the National Irrigation Congress. And this was basically an advocacy group, a lobbying effort to try to better the Desert Land Act to help get public lands that the federal government owned to be distributed and to bring water to them. Um, and to talk about need, the needful, needful irrigation. About 600 people attended the first National Irrigation Congress and this became a very dominant uh, force in the West uh, throughout the 1890s. 1892 also sees the publication of a French astronomer, Camille Flammarion's book, The Planet Mars. And he is the first to sort of take Schiaparelli's maps and then update them and say, you know, if these things are really across the globe, um, it must take an intelligent population a dedicated population to do those things. And these people must be very democratic. And this is what really spurred on Percival Lowell and made it uh, his quest as well. Uh, my wife is joining us. Uh, she is in the audience and she, she can maybe talk to you a little bit about this later on. But she has a set of letters between Lowell and Flammarion that are in French um, that uh, talk about some of this. And so 1892, Flammarion publishes The Planet Mars, um, and this is really what makes Percival Lowell interested. But out west, there's more stuff going on. 1894 is the Cary Act, named for Wyoming's other senator, Joseph Cary. This was sort of a private corporate partnership to try to bring water to the arid west. It also mostly failed. There were a few places in Wyoming and Idaho that were important Cariac projects around Twin Falls, Idaho is probably the most famous, but it basically didn't work because states and private companies could not put the waterworks in place uh, before, uh, they didn't have the money to put the water in place before settlers came to buy it. It really pushed that we had tried just private citizens once, we tried state and private another time. It was really a push. The failure of the Cary Act showed that it was too expensive for state and local people to do it, that really the federal government would have to join in. 
So all of this stuff is going on around the same time. And this is when Percival Lowell sends Andrew Douglas, his, his, his buddy and astronomer, uh, to go to Arizona and look around for a place to study Mars. Now, Mars was coming in very close range to Earth in 1894. Uh, Lowell knew that desert lands were the best for observing. And so he sent Douglas around, he went to Prescott, he went to Tombstone, he went to Tempe to look for a place to build uh, an observatory. And he chose Flagstaff. And uh, this is uh, the Clark Telescope. It shows Percival at work here. Uh, this is still there. This is where viewer, visitors could come uh, and look through this just as Percival did uh, in 1894. So, all of this is going on. Lowell publishes his first book, Mars, in 1895. And Mars is really an interesting study because, of course, it is as much fantasy as it is a scientific study. He is taking observations and, let's just say, going with it as much as he possibly could. Some of the things that he writes about irrigation, Mars, I put in quotes here. If beings of sufficient intelligence inhabited Mars, they would have to resort to irrigation to support life. Irrigation must be the all-engrossing Martian pursuit. He noted that he could see a network of markings that looked like an irrigation system and suggested that a planet-wide project such as this suggested a lack of party politics and that the canals hinted at the existence of beings who are in advance of and not behind us on the journey of life. And Lowell believed in the evolution of planets, and he believed that Mars was an older planet, and desertification was what was happening to all planets. And we'll talk a little bit about that in just a little bit. So Lowell publishes Mars right about the same time the National Irrigation Congress and Irrigation Age is at work in places like Arizona. Well, the local papers, and this was probably the funnest part of this, uh, of this research, was looking through the local papers in Arizona to see what they said. The Prescott Weekly Journal Miner in June of 1895 says, scientists announced that the inhabitants of Mars understand irrigation perfectly and that the planet is covered by a network of canals. It is too bad that Mars cannot be represented at our National Irrigation Congress. I just love that. They're making connections between what's happening in the West and what Lowell is saying is happening on Mars. Then you have the Boston Post, Percival Lowell's hometown. Uh, this big story about the people of Mars and talking all about what Lowell has written. And then this nice view of uh, Mars looks like on a summer day. I love the togas um, and the palm trees. Uh, this doesn't happen very often in Flagstaff. I don't know, maybe those of you in Phoenix and Tucson, this, you ever have toga day there? Maybe this is more common. Uh, there, but I don't think it's ever looked like that on Mars. And then the best one. This is by far the best story that I found. Uh, this is from the Coconino Sun, which was published here in Flagstaff from August 6, 1896, under the heading, Good Evening Mars. Flagstaff has the pleasure of meeting a neighbor. And I'm just going to read a little bit of this to you, um, just because it's so good. Flagstaff folks had an introduction to the inhabitants of Mars last Thursday evening. The Martians are pleasant people, intellectual and peculi peculiarly congenial to us Arizonans. Mar Mars is almost one grand Arizona without the canyons or mountains or Flagstaff. They could give us cards and spades and big and, big and little casino on des deserts and then beat us. They have deserts bigger than our North and South America and flatter than this mud pounded down. Furthermore, they know how to make the desert blossom as the rose, though the roses are blue instead of like ours. The deserts of Mars have a bluish green vegetation. The green, of course, is the leaves, therefore the blue is the roses. Therefore, they have blue roses on Mars. We of Arizona should feel distinctly friendly to those new acquaintances of ours, for they are liable to give us some valuable pointers in the way of irrigation. Already, we have learned something. The proper way to irrigate is to run canals diverging from the poles to the equator, tapping the melting snows of the polar regions. The canals should be all a uniform distance apart and be under one grand management. This Arizona should do. We should follow the Martians. The territory should forthwith annul all corporate and farmers canals and go in on the Martian plan. Bucky O'Neill 
can furnish any little ideas that may be lacking on how to accomplish it in the way of raising money from the government and of condemning existing canals. All being in readiness, the Mars system should be introduced to Arizona. I just love that. We should pull up the Mars version. And he goes on talking about, you know, how we can do this and how Flagstaff could become the centerpiece of this and Flagstaff would be popular on two different worlds. It is just amazing uh, what he is trying conjecturing here about how Flagstaff could be the, 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 the really the communication center between Mars and Earth uh, and the American West. Um, Flagstaff would come in for the expenditure of a fine share of Bucky's government funds in the excavating of canals. It should take to make, say, a dozen or a score of casually starting northeast, south, and west from the peaks uh, for the distance tributary to Flagstaff, say a million dollars. Think of a million dollars in the coffers of Flagstaff. Please, Bucky, let us have it right away. Well, Bruce Dingus, when I first submitted this to the Journal of Arizona History, said, you need to look into, into Bucky. What is the former sheriff of Prescott, the future Rough Rider, doing in a story about Mars? Well, Bucky was running to be the Arizona Territories representative. So territories, of course, did not have uh, senators. They had one non-voting lobbyist as a as a uh, territorial representative. Representative, and Bucky O'Neill was running for that on the populist ticket. Now, if you remember anything from your history, you'll know that the populists had started in the 1890s as a farmer's group. And then in 1896, read William Jennings Bryan, the great orator, um, on an issue to try to get silver uh, and buy metallism to increase the money supply and create inflation, which would help farmers. Bucky also proposed as a populist a national irrigation bill that the government can and should aid in the reclamation and irrigation of the arid lands of the West. So two years before being a Rough Rider, Bucky O'Neill, the rancher's pathfinder, was submitting a, or a plan to create really a socialist view of irrigation. We should, we've already helped build locks and canals in the East with government money. We should irrigate the West with federal money as well. And he was giving lectures about it. And that's the connection between Bucky and Mars. Well, there's another connection here. And this is William Smythe in 1900 published his first book, The Conquest of Arid America. I'll talk more about Smythe later on, but he basically in this book was just sort of a catalog of all the reclamation efforts going on in all of the arid states. And so there'd be a chapter about Arizona, a chapter about New Mexico, a chapter about Utah, a chapter about Wyoming, a chapter about Montana, a chapter about Nevada, and everything that was going on and why this was so good. He says, Arid aridity's chief blessing is that it compels the use of irrigation, and irrigation is a miracle. It's a miracle because you're not relying upon, upon rain. It's very much a progressive idea in which you are managing a resource for the greatest good. Gifford Pinchot, of course, was famous talking about the forests, the most good for the most people at the most time, at the most time. Okay, and this is very much a progressive idea. Irrigation is the proper management of water in the arid west. And that's what he's talking about, the conquest of arid America. Conversely, John Van Dyke writes a different way of thinking about the deserts of the West. And he is really the first to talk about the deserts in much of the way that Arizonans today think of them for their own natural beauty. And he's very much taking a different view of deserts and says the waste places of the earth, the barren deserts, the tracts forsaken of men and given over to loneliness have a peculiar attraction of their own. The weird solitude, the great silence, the grim desolation of the very things which every desert wanderer eventually falls in love with. The deserts should never be reclaimed. They, should, they are the breathing spaces of the West and should be preserved. Quite a different view to Smythe and Reclamation Everywhere. Of course, 1902, the Reclamation Act is passed. Teddy Roosevelt brings it about. Federal law that brings federal government money to arid lands in the 20 states of the West to reclaim the desert. And the first project built is Arizona's Roosevelt Dam. And there's an early version of it. 
uh, I always try to think about how you would drive over that uh, today. Um, so uh, this has been called the most important piece of legislation in the 20th century West because it brought the federal government clearly involved as a partner in the West development. Mary Austin, the famous writer from California, writes another book in appreciation of the deserts called The Land of Little Rain. And she talks about a land of lost rivers with little in it to love, yet a land that once visited must become back to inevitably. Really a love. She's very much like Van Dyke. Now we're back to Mars. 1904, the Arizona Republic tells us a little bit more about Percival Lowell. Um, and he claims to have discovered that a sea on the planet Mars changes color, which suggests different um, plants are growing there. Um, and so he talks about this and he says, the Republic says, but we understand that Mr. Lowell has been unable to determine so far whether irrigation on the planet Mars is attended by any of the difficulties which have beset the industry in some parts of the West. It does not tell us, for example, whether the priority rights irrigators on Mars have the first whack at the water in the canals. That has to do with prior appropriation, which is Western water law that says first person to use the stream has the right to use it. And so they're really taking this basic law of water rights in the West and then wondering about Mars. Presumably as well, irrigation on Mars is done by the Martian government. Astronomers have been of the opinion for a long time that the canal so regularly marked on the planet evidence the work of being similar to ourselves and this being conceded the vast scale upon which the work has been carried out precludes the theory that private enterprise was sufficient for the task. Wonderful stuff. Mars comes back with, or Percival Lowell comes back once again with another book about Mars and its canals that talks about the organized entity or the community of interest and that these intelligent and non bellicose character of the community, that this has to be a peaceful uh, worldwide effort to bring this. And this is a map from his book, Mars and its Canals of 1905, again, showing the polar ice caps and all those canals feeding all those desert oases across the planet. In Mars and its canals, he has a couple of really interesting passages. He says that it, to stand on the summit of the San Francisco peaks here in Flagstaff, you'd get a sense of what it's like to be on Mars. The semblance of the desert's lambent saffron to the telescopic tints of the Martian globe is strikingly impressive. The juxtaposition of forest and desert in Arizona's painted desert has a Martian in look, uh, is Martian in look. This is a Google Earth shot taken from the top of the San Francisco peaks. I don't know, does that look like Mars? He also talked about the deserts of Mars and what they would be like without irrigation. Pitiless as our deserts are, they're but faint forecasts of the state of things on Mars. What a terrible significance for everything Martian lies in the single word, desert. And if you've seen the recent helicopter views of Mars, it certainly does look dry. A friend of, of, of Lowell's, a, pr a professor, an archeologist by the name of uh, Edward Morse visited Flagstaff. And he also wrote a book called Mars and its Mystery in 1906. And he made more connections between Arizona and the red planet. This is a picture of Morris at the telescope. He went out to Rogers Lake, which is just west of Flagstaff, southwest of Flagstaff, which most of the time doesn't have any water at all in it. And he said, you know, when you look at these cracks in the mud, that kind of looks like those canals that we can see. So it must be similar. Uh, he also made connections of to what we can look at pottery crackle or mud cracks. And those look like Mars in oh, Mars, Lowell's low, low globe looks a lot like Schiaparelli's, which looks a lot like what we'd see railroads would look like. And he makes some, some speculation about what the Martians are seeing of Earth. If it were possible to conceive by analogy a creature on Mars furnished with a telescope, he would undoubtedly correlate the irrigating regions of Arizona as similar to nature to his own canals. So not only are we seeing Martian canals, but the Martians are seeing Earth canals and they all work together. The San Francisco call made another connection to this in 1907, talking about the Grand Canyon, which must look to the Martians like their own great canals. Just love that one. Uh, Lowell, one of the things I write about is that Lowell, when he was trying to make these references to Mars, 
he did did it oftentimes through descriptions of northern Arizona. And these are all places that I've mapped that he went to and visited. He went, to, of course, to the peaks. He went into uh, Oak Creek Canyon and Sycamore Canyon. He went to Mormon Lake. He went out to the Petrified Desert and Painted Desert and Petrified Forest out here. He went to the Navajo and Hopi uh, Pueblos up, up this way. Um, he There's a picture of him driving, pulling his big red car through uh, the the little the flooding little Colorado uh, in the San Francisco peaks in a couple of places at the Grand Canyon. He was very much an outdoorsman. He was a founding member of the Appalachian Mountain Club. And so when he explored Arizona, he made notes about it and then made those connections and described Mars in Arizona terms. Um, he continued this in his last two books in 1908 and 1910, Mars is the Abode of Life in which he made comparisons between Mars and the work of Seahart Merriam, shown here, who talked about the different environments, the different, uh, he studied the San Francisco peaks and talked about the different environments from the bottom to the top and said that Martians could also be living at different levels, that people that were concerned about the lack of oxygen in Mars just had to go to the top of the San Francisco peaks and see the connection. In the evolution of worlds, he talked about the, the problem of, of deserts. And again, it's really talking about that the worlds evolve just like humans evolve, and that eventually they all become deserts. In 1916, Percival Lowell died. He is buried at this mausoleum right there that looks like a telescope on Mars Hill here in Arizona in Flagstaff. And with really with him, his ideas of the Martian uh, canals mostly died with Lowell. They were not really uh, supported by his successors at Lowell. And certainly they were disproved when uh, voyagers got there in the 1970s. What do we make of all this? And I just love this, found this in the archives. This is a picture of Percival digging canals on Mars. And this was a spoof birthday card given to him. What can we make of Lowell and Mars and the American West? Well, he is in this line of conservation. Here's a picture of Gifford Pinchot. I mentioned his idea of the greatest good for the greatest number. Is Lowell talking about the greatest good for the greatest number of Martians? It actually is sort of a socialistic redistribution of water from the polar ice caps to save the planet. Sort of, sort of fits in that idea of conservation. Does Lowell appreciate deserts like, Jay, like uh, Mary Austin or, or John Van Dyke? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, the cosmic circumstance about which them about which deserts is most terrible is not that deserts are, but that deserts have begun to be. Not as local, evitable evils are they only to be pictured, but as the general, unescapable death grip on our world. Can't say anything harsher about a desert than that. He did not appreciate deserts like these early naturalist writers did. Instead, he fits very hand in hand with William Smythe. They are reclamation brothers, both born in Massachusetts, both moved to arid states, uh, Smythe to Kearney, Nebraska, Lowell to Flagstaff, both published in the 1890s books about irrigation and continued to argue for it through Mars and its canals and the conquest of arid America. Smythe famously said, aridity's chief blessing was that it compels the use of irrigation and irrigation is a miracle. Lowell said, if beings of sufficient intelligence inhabited, they would have to resort to irrigation to support life. Irrigation must be the all engrossing Martian pursuit. I finished my article up with this quote from Ray Badbury in the Martian Chronicles. Um, after uh, nuclear war has devastated earth, people have escaped to Mars and repopulated the planet. And they're looking down at the canals as shown on the book cover here. And they said they reached the canal. It was long and straight and cool and wet and reflective in the night. I've always wanted to see a Martian, said Michael. Where are they, Dad? You promised. There they are, said Dad, as he shifted Michael on his shoulder and pointed straight down. The Martians were there. Timothy began to shiver. The Martians were there, reflected in the water. Timothy and Michael and Robert and Mom and Dad. The Martians stared back at them for a long, silent time from the rippling water. I think as Percival Lowell looked into the waters of Arizona, he saw Mars reflected back at him. And I think that's a good way to end. So I'll stop there and take questions. 
Let's see. Thank you. Thank you. That was a that was a great summary, and it was a, it's a fantastic article. And as uh, some of you may notice, I put the link in the chat to, to how people can access the the uh, the article. Uh, let's see. We have a couple questions in the chat. Um, one is, how many books did Lowell uh, do for Mars and Pluto? So. I, so he didn't write about Pluto. So he started the the uh, effort at Planet X. He believed that there was another planet out there and started that process, but died before Pluto was discovered. I would, should really refer to my wife back for that. Um, the uh, So I think, so it'd just be five books basically about Mars um, over between 1895 and 1910. Uh, and again, these are all, you know, conjecture based upon, you know, what he was looking at and then what he believed. And it's, it's just, it's, it's sort of fun to read it because he has all this sort of appendix of mathematical formulas and stuff. But in the end, it's, I can see canals, there's a lot of them, and it must take intelligent people, and they must be God, they must be non-warring to do that. And there's a lot of conjecture after that. So it's really sort of fun to, to read those today. It, was he was he uh how were his theories um taken at the time was he considered a, a crackpot or was he more sort of in the in the mainstream some believed he was a crackpot some thought he was mainstream and believable and that's when you know, i think those who believed i think saw out west that we were doing the same thing you know and and i think that's that's sort of the the the, the basis of um you know what I what I was writing about. I'm certainly I'm no Mars scholar. Uh, I'm a scholar of the West, and so trying to trying to bring it here. So I, I would I would uh, yield to my wife, the Lowell Observatory archivist, uh, for more about about Lowell and and Mars. So let's see. We have another question. Uh, you mentioned that the Reclamation Act under TR covered 20 states. I usually think of the West as comprising 11 states, excluding Alaska and Hawaii, which are the other nine so states. My guess on that, and I'd have to pull them up, um, pull up a map to look at that, but I believe they would include really what we would think of as the borderland states to the, to the arid West. And so the North Dakota, South Dakota, um, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, those would be added to the list. I think that would get us closer to 20, um, probably Minnesota, Iowa, and that tier of states as well. So I think going back east, those things could apply, reclamation could apply to those states uh, more so than just what we think of as the arid west today. Uh, it looks like uh, Lauren commented that Lowell wrote a memoir on trans-Neptunian planet in 1915. There you go. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks for uh, showing me up. Uh, and then we have another question. Uh, so how was Lowell seen in the local community in Flagstaff? Uh, very well. Um, you know, he really brought science to a frontier community. Uh, he helped to bring what became Northern Arizona University to Flagstaff. Um, and, you know, for a small railroad town that has a lumber mill in it, to bring a university, or at the time a teacher's college, and a scientific, a scientific endeavor like Lowell Observatory was really big. Uh, Flagstaff also got the, one of the first experimental forests um, uh, created in Flagstaff around the same time. And so uh, I think he was very well liked in Flagstaff. Uh, he had a a house with they referably what they call um, in uh, at Lowell uh, the baronial mansion up on Mars Hill uh, that he lived in, which is not there anymore. Um, but he uh, gave speeches in uh, at the university, um, donated money. I think it was, he was pretty well liked in Flagstaff. Uh, living with the archivist, I learned a lot about Lowell. Um, I think some of the really fun things she could actually tell you a little bit about, she brought, uh, is, is, has a big map that she is getting digitized tomorrow that is, um, uh, so when, when per Percival Lowell sent Andrew Douglas out here to Arizona in 1894 
to look for possible sites that I mentioned. And she has the map that Douglas took with him as he went around to Bisbee and Tempe uh, and Tombstone and Flagstaff looking for sites. And she's then digitized that map and has his original writing. Of course, uh, Douglas is well best known for what he did after Lowell, which is uh, he is the founder of tree ring data, uh, dendrochronology. And to think about somebody like that who could was an astronomer and seeing big spaces and time through space could also look at tree rings and see time uh, is absolutely fascinating. So, wow, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, Jill asked a, a follow-up question: Were there any naysayers in, in Flagstaff? Uh, I haven't seen any, and I think this probably has to do with Western boosterism. You know, when when you have in this time period, you know, Flagstaff is a couple thousand. Phoenix is a couple thousand. Phoenix isn't that much bigger. Uh, Prescott, you know, these places are all sort of boosting uh, their local economy. And anybody who is bringing you into the national limelight is good. And I think certainly the local paper was not very skeptical. I haven't seen anything skeptical of Mars or what Lowell was talking about. They, they, they jumped on. And again, yeah, that is boosterism, but I also think that is, you know, this is the same thing we're doing. When they say we need to bring Martian uh, irrigation to Arizona, they're talking about we need to bring federal managed right, uh, irrigation to Arizona, that the local, the private isn't going to work. And that's what we do. So in a way, I guess what I should have said was, instead of looking into the, instead of the Martians looking in, when we look into Roosevelt Dam, we do have that is the Martian plan at work in Arizona. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's the thing I think that interested me the most about this article. I just arrived here in Arizona, and, the, and yours was one of the first articles that I edited for the for the journal. Didn't need a lot of a lot of editing, uh, so it made my my job easy when I first got here. Uh, but yeah, I was I was really fascinated about that that there was almost a sense that the the Martians have a collective estate. Uh, you know, up, up there and that, that there are lessons to be learned. So I, I thought that was the most interesting part for me. Uh oh. I have a former student asking me a, a question about. Uh, all right. So he's asking about the end of the frontier. And actually, I had a slide about Frederick Jackson Turner, and I took it out because he doesn't necessarily talk about water. So of course, Frederick Jackson Turner is very famous in 1893 of giving the significance of the frontier in American history, which is the foundational document for understanding Western history, that the frontier was a place uh, with less than two people per square mile, well, uh, ignoring, of course, native peoples, uh, and also the place whereby Europeans became Americans. Um, so Turner was talking about um, that the West, the frontier, was the most significant part of American history. And he wasn't really addressing water and, and irrigation in that sense, other than the fact that he said that frontiers people were always innovative. And then when he talked about um, the frontier, he said that the most innovative part of America is not the East, but the Western frontier. And so I think he probably would have applauded what Lowell was talking about because he's really talking about Martians and Westerners being very innovative. Um, I was very curious about John Wesley Powell because I think Powell and Lowell are interesting together. And I actually uh, have looked through some of the Powell papers to see if there's any mention of the other person. Lowell doesn't ever mention John Wesley Powell. John Wesley Powell doesn't mention Lowell. Lowell doesn't mention Smythe. Smythe doesn't mention Lowell. But they're talking about the same thing. I mean, the conquest of arid America, you could, you could subtitle uh, Mars as the conquest of an arid planet. Uh, it's, they're very much in line. Hopefully I that asked your, answer your question, Zach. Thank you for coming. Um, now my Dean is asking me a question. Uh, yeah. Well, that's a really good question, Chris. I don't know the answer about whether they assume that Martians had deforested the planet. Um, I know that Lowell believed that um, planets evolve, as I mentioned, and that he believed that Mars, because it was smaller, 
was had a smaller mass and was de, was becoming desert faster than Earth. And so he saw that by looking at Mars, we could see our future. Um, and that's part of, again, I, I think a, 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 an argument for uh, why we should irrigate as well. I don't know if he saw deforestation though as, the, as, as a precursor to Mars's um, planet. That might be good work for you to look at um, here while you're in Flagstaff. I think that's a really interesting idea. All right, any other questions? Uh... I've, I've had a former student and my current dean, I expect my wife to answer me, ask me a question to put me on the spot as well. I would, I would also add, tell you though that, uh, you know, the question about how is, Fly, was, how is Lowell, you know, received in Flagstaff? I would say since his death, he's also been received in Lowell Observatory as a fundamental part of Flagstaff today. Um, you know, it's, it's still a highlight. Uh, one of the great things about it is that history is very much alive at Lowell. Um, I know that, of course, because of my archivist wife, but also just you can go up there and you can look through the telescope that Lowell looked through in those pictures. And that's the Clark telescope. You can look through the telescope that Clyde Tombaugh looked at through when he discovered Pluto. You can see the original Pluto plate. You can see uh, the car that uh, Lowell drove. Uh, you can see the telescope that he had as a child. Um, it's really an amazing place. Uh, and it's just, it, you know, hopefully when the pandemic is over, it'll be a lot more open than it is now. It's still limited with that as a lot of museums are, but it's really an amazing place to think about all the people that were there. You know, the um, the Slifer brothers started this whole idea of the red shift and the idea that the university was expanding. That started at Lowell. Um, it's really been a place of pioneering astro astronomical work. And to be able to go there is absolutely amazing. Yeah, and as my, my colleague Shannon Fleischman uh, just pointed out, the Pluto plate will be on display at our uh, new exhibit opening in Tucson in, in, in late May. Uh, so come on down and check that out if you have a chance. Um, I, I, I have a, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Just um, I, I'm just curious if you've assigned your article in in a, a class, and if so, how did students uh, react? Well, students are always curious about what the how the professor writes because they hear nothing but critique for, about what they what I think of their work. So they always want to read uh, what I've written. Uh, I've assigned it to graduate level classes, and they think it's interesting. Uh, although they sort of wonder, you know, what I'm doing looking at Mars when I should be studying the American West. I like to tell them, of course, that my writing is out of this world um, <laughs> when I'm talking about Mars, but uh, uh, that's about it. Um, you know, I, I would also say that, you know, the other thing that, of course, Flagstaff has, as most of you probably know, is that it was also involved in the uh, Apollo missions. And so, you know, and I know you'll be bringing some of that into your exhibit, but astronauts trained in Flagstaff and they did a lot of the moon mapping at Lowell Observatory in the 1960s. So it's a really interesting idea that you guys are bringing in uh, Arizona's place in the, um, in the, in, in astronomy and certainly with, with Tucson as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the exhibit is definitely has a, has a statewide, uh, lens uh, so I think you know and I, I would I would also add that you know the um, the novels about Mars place uh, some of the characters is, is being from the mountains of Arizona so you know I'm mostly talking about fiction tonight but there's other more recent fiction uh, that's talking about uh, the role of Arizona in in uh, Martian history as well Well, any other questions uh, from the from the audience? Could everybody turn their cameras on for a minute? Yeah, let's absolutely let's make this more interactive. Feel free to if if, uh, if I do this with my students just to make sure that everyone's still awake. 
but I just want to see all of you and to thank you all personally for coming tonight. Uh, it's a beautiful night in Arizona, and I really appreciate everybody being here um, for this. Thank you. Well, I, I, yeah, this was an outstanding talk, and I know that um, I, your article was really helpful in some of my research, just placing some of the early Arizona space exploration, the, the gazing up to the stars into, into context. So thank you for writing it and help me. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, Arizona is a great place to, to stargaze, and we still yeah. have that. Um, it's just amazing, amazing. I actually had a student this semester write, so one of the things they do is teach public history, and we work through a a digital consortium through BYU and the Intermountain Histories Project uh, in which students put up basically digital tours and one of them was doing dark sky sites around the Intermountain West and Flagstaff was the first dark sky city and that's a, an interesting con connection to that as well and I know there yeah, are other, there... other places in Arizona that are dark sky friendly. So there are 29 international dark sky cities and Arizona has six of those so that's pretty cool and that's and one of the reasons why Arizona is kind of leading that space exploration. Absolutely. So, well, I've got grading to do. Uh, if anybody would like to join in, I could send you some papers. How about you, Lauren? No, thanks. <laughs> All right. I'll pass as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you. But I guess that's pretty much it. Zach, nice to see you. Thank you for coming. Uh, Chris, right. thanks for coming as well. And thanks everybody else. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you for thank you for coming, everyone. Have a good night. Hopefully, this will be the last Zoom presentation I do for a while. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Thanks everybody. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you.